So for the past couple weeks, I've been absent from worship because I've been hanging out with scouts and with youth. Um, and that has been a true blessing, and I'll have the opportunity to share a little bit more about that and what that's all about. Um, but while I've been away, I know Pastor Kate has been uh, sharing a message with you talking about uh, how we need to stay true to God's call. One of God's calling for all of us can be found in the mission statement of the United Methodist Church, which says that we are to make disciples for the transformation of the world. Uh, and Mike, thanks for the image. I love the image today. But I want to talk this morning about the, the gift of discipleship. The gift of discipleship. It truly is a gift. I know the, the message this morning can be a really hard message, but I, I want to break it down a little bit for you, a little bit for you. If we take a look, each of the scriptures explain how God has set clear moral guidelines for us to follow that we are to take seriously. Uh, none of there are there to harm us, but to make life and relationship with one another and God even better. If you take a look at the psalm today, it's a testimony of why following God's instruction is a good thing. If you really take a look at the words of the psalmist, can we bring those up real quick? Sorry, Barry. If we take a look at the words, happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. This is coming deep inside the heart of the psalmist who's writing about following in the way of the Lord, following in the laws and the decrees that God has set forth is something to rejoice over, something that we celebrate, something that helps us and guides us, something that brings us into right relationship with one another, but also into right relationship with God. So that being said, then we jump forward to the Matthew 5 passage from the Sermon on the Mount, and we hear some pretty harsh uh, messages going on in there. And, um, at some point, I'd like to break that down even more, but the, the main point that I want to share here, this is, this is the passage I like to call the you heard it said, but I tell you passage, uh, where it goes into that. So if we take a look at it, and if we take it very seriously, there'd be a lot of people going around with missing arms and eyeballs and stuff like that. But is that truly what Christ was trying to say to the disciples at that time, I don't think so. What I do think is that we as a people have a tendency very often to just gloss over the message. How many of us say the Lord's Prayer rotely by memory, but never really take into account the message that it says to us? The Ten Commandments are a very important list of moral code, but you can learn them and just forget them and not really take them very seriously. In this, Jesus is talking about certain things that are very important to God and very important for each of us as we relate with one another and as we are in relationship with God and reminding people that there's something more to the message. That if we miss the point of it, if we don't take it seriously, that it's going to cause irreparable harm, not just to us individually, but to the community that God was trying to form. So it's a message reminding people of what the law says, but taking it a step further. That it's not just about words on a page. It's not just about a memorized law or rule or code, but it's something that God wishes for us to take to heart. To understand not just what we are to do or not to do, but to understand why we are to do it or why we are not supposed to do it. Does that make sense? As disciples, it is important for us to take God seriously. And as disciple makers, 
We need to help those we guide to understand the importance of God's laws for us as well. See, it is a gift to be a disciple. It is a gift to make disciples as well. For us to be able to make disciples, we need to understand these laws. We need to understand these codes. We need to understand the guidelines that God is setting for us to be in right relationship with God, but to also be in right relationship in community. So we need to take time to learn them and to understand them. So I want to go back to the past couple weeks and share with you a little bit more about that. Um, Two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go on a scout weekend with my son up to Gettysburg and the scout troop, Um, and I'm an assistant scoutmaster for Troop 92, Uh, so I got to share in that time with them. One of the really neat things is it was a Weeblo weekend. Uh, One of the things scout troops often do, they will host a weekend where they invite Weeblos to come and check out the troop and learn a little bit more about what Boy Scouts is about, uh, which is very different from Cub Scouts. Um, It becomes much more independent on the part of the Boy Scouts once the Weeblos and the Cub Scouts move on up. And one of the things that they did was had different stations set up where the, the kids got to learn scout skills. They got to learn how to build a fire. They got to learn how to do search and rescue and go into the woods and find an injured person and pull them out. They got to learn several other skills, and they were all being taught by other scouts. The adults just got to sit back and watch and just be a part of witnessing what was happening as experienced scouts were training and teaching younger scouts. It was a really beautiful thing. It was an amazing opportunity to see what it looks like when we intentionally guide other people in good things, in stuff that's going to help them. If you've ever had an opportunity on American Education Week to go to the school and watch the teachers teach, you get to see some of that as well. But the, the, the mission in scouting is to bring up younger scouts to be trained scouts that then train other kids to be good scouts as well. Then last weekend, I had the opportunity to go on the rock retreat again and to be blessed once again to be a youth pastor, to be blessed to work with kids, to bring them into opportunities to grow in their faith, to learn, learn more about who they are, to learn about what God is in their lives, to grow in that faith, and then to share it with others. It is an amazing blessing. And let me tell you why a little bit. A little bit about me. Some of you know, many of you probably don't. Growing up, I was an at-risk kid. I barely made it through high school. I got into a lot of trouble. My grades were horrendous. I almost didn't even pass my senior year. Um, I was not a very good kid. I got bullied and picked on a lot, so my response to that was to become the biggest, meanest person I could to scare people away from trying to bully me. So a lot of fights and a lot of things that I should not have done or should not have gotten into was where I went. I didn't have a scout leader. I didn't have a youth pastor. I didn't have opportunities for mentorship or other people to go to to help me navigate the road of being an adolescent, of what to, re- what to do or how to respond when you're getting bullied or picked on, what to do and how to respond when life throws curveballs at you and people that are important to you in your life at a young age pass away or are not there for you anymore. I didn't have anyone to help me to navigate those times in my life. So being able to do that now for others, being able to be a scout leader for other scouts has been a real blessing Being able to be a youth pastor and provide a youth ministry that loves, supports, 
follows, holds the hand of other youth as they're going through difficult times in their life and adolescence. It's been a blessing. It's been a blessing. And one of the things that... um, It's something I love about scouting and about youth ministry is the opportunity to work with young kids and to make life better for each and every one of them. One of the things that I'm glad that we're celebrating this morning is Scout Sunday because in addition to um, anything I... Well, let me back up. One of the things was Scouts for this church to celebrate. We have four... Girl Scout troops that meet here at our church. We have one Cub Scout group that meets at our church as well. And we have several other kids that have been a part of scouting and are a part of that also. So I shared a little bit of my story with you and why I've begun working with youth. I was a teacher before, now a youth pastor, scout leader, things like that. I want to share the story of what actually grew scouting, give you a little bit of the history of both Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and why we celebrate it today. For Girl Scouts, it was founded by Juliette Gordon Lowe, who envisioned an organization that would prepare girls to meet their world with courage, confidence, and character. In 1912, in the midst of the progressive era, and at a time when women in the United States couldn't yet vote, this nearly deaf 51-year-old sparked a worldwide movement inspiring girls to embrace together their individuality, strength, and intellect. Juliet, affectionately known as Daisy by her family and close friends, gathered 18 girls in her hometown of Savannah, Georgia to share what she had learned abroad about a new outdoor and educational program for youth. And with this, the Girl Scout movement was born. Along with Juliet, these first Girl Scouts blazed trails and redefined what was possible for themselves and for girls everywhere. That small gathering of girls Juliet Gordon Lowe hosted over a century ago has grown into a global movement in which all girls can see themselves reflected. And that today includes nearly 3 million Girl Scouts in 92 countries and more than 59 million alumni united, in, um, united across distance and decades by lifelong friendships, shared adventures, and the desire to do big things to make the world a better place. The history of the Girl Scouts. The Boy Scouts, on January 24th, 1908, the Boy Scouts movement begins in England with the publication of the first installment of Sir Robert Robert Baden-Powell's Scouting for Boys. The name Baden-Powell was already well known to many English boys, and thousands of them eagerly bought up the handbook. By the end of April, the serialization of Scouting for Boys was completed, and scores of impromptu Boy Scout troops had sprung up across Britain. Boys loved the lessons on tracking and observation and organized uh, elaborate games using the book. Hearing this, Baden-Powell decided to write a non-military field manual for adolescents that would also emphasize the importance of morality and good deeds. He decided to try out some of his ideas on an actual group of boys. On January 25th, 1907, he took a diverse group of 21 adolescents to Brown Sea Island uh, in Dorsetshire, where they set up camp for a fortnight With the aid of other instructors, he taught the boys about camping, observation, deduction, woodcraft, boating, life-saving, patriotism, and chivalry. Many of these lessons were learned through inventive games that were very popular with the boys. The first Boy Scouts meeting was a great success. The American version of the Boy Scouts had its origins in an event that occurred in London in 1909. Chicago publisher William Boyce was lost in the fog when a Boy Scout came to his aid. After guiding Boyce to his destination, the boy refused a tip 
explaining that as a Boy Scout, he would not accept payment for doing a good deed. This anonymous gesture inspired boys to organize several regional U.S. youth organizations, specifically the Woodcraft Indians and the Sons of Daniel Boone, into the Boy Scouts of America, incorporated on February 8, 1910. The movement soon spread throughout the country. In 1916, Baden-Powell organized Wolf Cubs, which became known as Cub Scouts in the United States. The Boy Scouts of America is the largest scouting organization in the United States of America and one of the largest youth organizations in the U.S., with more than 2.4 million youth participants and nearly 1 million adult volunteers. The BSA was founded in 1910, and since then, more than 110 million Americans have been participants in BSA programs at one time. So for the Girl Scouts... It was started by a 51-year-old lady, nearly deaf, who wanted to make a difference in the lives of girls at a time when they did not have all the freedoms uh, nearly that they should have, uh, some of which they have gained now. And for Baden-Powell, it was using experiences that he had as a youth and as a military person to make a difference in the lives of adolescents. And you've heard how many alumni... 59 million alumni for Girl Scouts, 110 million alumni for Boy Scouts. If you've been a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout or a leader for one of them, could you raise your hand? Look around the room, Scouts. Pretty incredible stuff. Thank you for being a part of Scouting. Part of what has made scouting so successful in growing young boys and girls into youth with great character and high moral standing has to do with the codes that they proclaim, teach, and commit to memory. We talked about some of those that we reflected on in Scripture from Psalm 119 and also from Matthew 5 and how important they are. For scouting, they determined that these were vitally important for scouts to know and memorize as well. Uh, just so you see how important they are, I'd like to invite a couple of the scouts up. I'd like to invite Ryan and uh, Kira to come up. Go ahead up to the altar. And Kira is going to share with you the um, Girl Scout Promise, followed by the Girl Scout Law. Girl Scout Promise. On my honor, I will try to serve God and my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout Law. Girl Scout Law. I will do my best to be honest and fair friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong, and responsible for what I say and do, and to respect myself and others, respect authority, use resources wisely, make the world a better place, and to be a sister to every Girl Scout. Good job. Um, the Boy Scout Oath is, on my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country, and to obey the Scout Law to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. The scout law is a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Good job. Give them a hand. These are words that are read at the beginning of each scout meeting. They're ones that are committed to memory and are an important part of how they advance in their ranks. If they don't know them, they don't advance. These things are shared with them and reminded for them when they're advancing in ranks. And as they are growing, these are the character pieces that are reinforced for scouts. It is an amazing thing to watch, and it is amazing to watch the transformation that takes place in each of the kids as they're growing in scouting. And uh, the scouting ministry that is offered, that we support here at the church, is to be commended and to be celebrated, and anything we could do to support it, we should try and do. Um, 
but it started by a couple scout leaders using their experiences, their life experiences, to invest into the lives of other kids and to make a difference. Based on what they did, based on their commitments of what they made, they started something that grew far beyond what they could have ever possibly imagined. Um, the scouting ministry, not just in the U.S., but around the world, is tremendous, it's huge, and it makes a difference in the lives of other kids. This morning, we're talking about the, how discipleship is a gift. What are the gifts that we can offer? What are the ways that we can use our life experiences, our faith, our knowledge, our talents to invest in the lives of other people? God calls each and every one of us to make disciples for the transformation of the world. And as I was reading through the history of them, the history of Girl Scouts struck me that she was 51 years old. She was nearly deaf, but she still had a love and a passion and experiences and all that she could share that began a transformation in the lives of so many young girls, even till today. For us, it's time for, that we need to reflect on what it is that God is calling us to do. What are ways that we can invest in the lives of others to make a difference in their lives? What is something that we can do to let other people know the love of God, to help them to grow in that faith and grow in that knowledge, to help them develop character that will carry them through the rest of their lives and make a difference for others? It's all about... It's all about <laughs> like when you take a pebble and you throw it into a pond and the ripple effects go out. Whether you were a scout or not, you could probably think of at least one person, maybe a teacher, maybe a parent, maybe a relative that has made a difference in your life for a specific reason. Each and every one of us has the ability to be that and to do that for someone else. And God is calling us in that. There's one other story I was going to share, and I didn't bring it with me this morning, so I'll save that for another time. Um, but suffice it to say, one of the things I encourage uh, the youth to do all the time, we do affirmation notes to one another every now and then just to encourage each other in faith. And I ask the youth to put them into their Bible to hold on to them for future times. One of the things I can say as a, as a youth pastor and working with other kids, um, you don't do youth ministry for the paycheck. <laughs> the paycheck comes in the letter that you get from a youth that lets you know that they appreciate what you offered in their life. The paycheck comes when you find out that you've made a difference in the life of someone else. I see that as God's blessing for each of us when we're doing things that help to make other disciples, to glorify God's kingdom, and to advance God into the world in many different ways. So as you go into this week, I want you to pray and I want you to reflect on what it is that, how you can use and share your gifts, your talents, your faith and experience to make a difference in the lives of others and possibly even future generations. And then sit back and watch the paycheck come as God blesses your heart with everything that you experience and you see happen as a result of God blessing your discipleship in your life. Amen? Amen. All right. If you could please rise and join us in our hymn of sending. Um, step by step. It's in the green book on 3004. <laughs> 